Hello everybody, a local guy, amazing reader, decided to offer his services and read the article that I wrote about the conflicts issue. So let's see if he does better than AI. Here we go. Hi, I'm Ed, a longtime listener of Mentor Lawyer's material on the Dan Markell murder case. I'm a local. I live here in Tallahassee. I listened to the video presentation Mentor Lawyer put up a couple of days ago, his deep dive into the conflicts issues surrounding Dan Rashbaum's representation of Donna Adelson, Charles Adelson, and then Donna again. It was read through an AI software, and the final product wasn't that good. So given my previous background in the broadcast industry, I offered Mentor Lawyer to do the reading, and he took me up on it. Let's see if I can do better than AI. So here we go. A deep dive into the Charles Adelson conflict of interest defense by Mentor Lawyer, read to you by a real human being, me, Ed. Charles Adelson, the South Florida dentist convicted in the murder for hire plot that culminated in the murder of his former brother-in-law, FSU law professor Dan Markell, recently filed a motion in the appellate court that is considering the appeal from his conviction and life sentence, Florida's first district court of appeal, to, quote, relinquish jurisdiction, unquote, to the trial court. In essence, he is asking the appellate court to put a pause in his appeal and to allow him to go back to the trial court and ask that court grant Charles Adelson a new trial because Charles Adelson's main criminal defense lawyer at the trial level, Dan Rashbaum, allegedly gave him ineffective assistance of counsel because Rashbaum was conflicted by his prior representation of Charles Adelson's mother, Donna Adelson, who was also an alleged co-conspirator in the murder. If you're interested in the case and want to know all there is to know about this issue, then this video has everything you need to know about the conflict issues surrounding Dan Rashbaum's representation of Donna Adelson, then Charles Adelson, then Donna Adelson. Generally, Supreme Court precedent establishes that the Sixth Amendment grants a defendant a, quote, fair opportunity to secure counsel of his own choice, unquote. This fair opportunity for the defendant to secure counsel of choice has limits. A defendant has no right, for example, to an attorney who has an actual conflict of interest to a relationship with an opposing party. Lewis v. United States, Supreme Court, 2016. It is not uncommon for defense attorneys to represent multiple defendants, even in cases involving alleged co-conspirators. However, when the court learns of a serious risk that an actual conflict of interest will develop between a defendant and his or her attorney, the court should inquire about the conflict and waiver thereof with the defendant. If the potential of conflict is serious enough, even if the conflict has not yet arisen, the trial court has the discretion to not accept a waiver of conflict of interest, and to therefore deny a defendant the choice of counsel by potentially conflicted attorney from representing that defendant. Failure to conduct such a conflict waiver inquiry in Florida will not result in reversal unless it is later shown that an actual conflict of interest developed in the case, and that conflict had an adverse impact on the defense. While the Sixth Amendment right to counsel is very important, it is not a license for defendants to engage in gamesmanship, putting the court in a catch-22 where there will be a viable Sixth Amendment appeal either because the trial court failed to remove a conflicted attorney or because the trial court allowed the conflicted attorney to remain in the case. The Third Circuit Court of Appeals, a federal appellate court, in considering a similar issue previously noted, quoting, it would be a rare case in which a defendant, after convincing the trial court not to disqualify his attorney of choice, should be able to obtain a reversal of his conviction on the basis of a conflict of interest. The district court should not be placed in a no-win situation of being confronted with a claim of a Sixth Amendment violation if the defendant is convicted, regardless of whether it has ceded to the defendant's expressed desire to be represented by his conflict-ridden attorney or has taken it upon itself to disqualify the attorney. If the defendant, after disclosure, insists on continued representation by the attorney and the court permits the representation to continue, any error is invited. See United States v. Punitor, Third Circuit Court, 1990, 
See also United States versus Moscone, Third Circuit, 1991, United States v. Lowry, Seventh Circuit, 1992, quote, a valid waiver of the right to conflict-free counsel bars any later claim of ineffective assistance growing from that conflict. That's quoting. But what if the trial court doesn't even know about the prior representation as it happened in the Charles Adelson case? The same principles should apply and deny a complaining defendant relief if a valid waiver of conflict of interest was obtained by the attorney who represented multiple defendants, or if the court finds that no conflict of interest waiver was obtained intentionally to, quote, set up, quote, a Sixth Amendment defense in the defendant's back pocket in case things did not go well at trial. So the question here is whether the Adelsons should use, could use, their Sixth Amendment right to counsel of their choice, constantly switch private attorneys between them, and then later claim ineffective assistance of counsel because the attorney they knowingly chose, Dan Rashbaum, had a conflict, and as they will certainly allege, because of that conflict, Dan Rashbaum made decisions that adversely impacted their defense. Let's look at this issue from an objective perspective. In this video, we will only discuss the conflict issues raised, being raised by Charles Adelson. Charles Adelson, Conflict Analysis. Charles Adelson, through his appellate lawyers, claims that Dan Rashbaum had an actual conflict of interest when Rashbaum represented Charles Adelson after having previously represented his co-conspirator, Donna Adelson, before Charles Adelson was charged. The theory by Charles Adelson's appellate lawyer is as follows. One, Dan Rashbaum represented Donna Adelson before Charles was charged in connection with the same matter, the allegation that the Adelsons were involved in a conspiracy to murder Dan Markell, and two, then, after Charles Adelson was charged in the murder of Dan Markell, Dan Rashbaum switched from representing Donna to representing Charles Adelson in the same matter, the criminal case arising out of the murder of Dan Markell. To support the allegations that there was an actual conflict of interest in Dan Rashbaum representing Charles Adelson, his appellate lawyers point to the following. One, Donna Adelson was listed by the state of Florida as a Category A witness in the state's discovery responses. Two, Donna Adelson was later listed as a defense witness for trial. Three, Donna Adelson was ultimately not called as a witness for trial by either side, quote, because she was removed from the defense witness list days before trial was to begin, unquote, after the state sought to interview Donna Adelson. From these facts, Charles Adelson's appellate lawyers argue that Donna Adelson's removal from the witness list was done in order to protect Donna's interests, i.e. in not being interviewed by the state, and against Charles Adelson's interests, i.e. a witness that could have corroborated appellant Adelson's testimony was not called by Mr. Rashbaum. They also argue that just like Judge Everett found vis-a-vis -vis Dan Rashbaum's representation of Donna Adelson a few weeks ago, Mr. Rashbaum engaged in a conflicted representation falling short of the ethical obligations for members of the Florida Bar because Mr. Rashbaum, quote, was operating under a conflict of interest based on duties owed to his former client Donna Adelson, whose attorney-client relationship predated his attorney-client relationship with Charles Adelson. Charles Adelson's lawyers finally argue that, quoting, a review of the record on appeal establishes that a conflict waiver inquiry was not conducted by the trial court, unquote. Then they seem arguing that a conflict waiver is invalid unless it was verified by the court, if the court inquired whether the waiver was knowing and voluntary. However, Charles Adelson's appellate lawyers, in their motion to relinquish jurisdiction, are silent about many material facts. For example, one, they are silent as to Charles Adelson's knowledge before he hired Dan Rashbaum that Dan Rashbaum had represented his parents before on the same matter. Well, obviously he knew, and they provide no explanation why Charles Adelson waited so long to raise the conflict issue. Two, they are silent as to whether or not Dan Rashbaum or an independent lawyer advised Charles Adelson about the potential for conflict of interest 
and about whether or not Charles Adelson waived the conflict and signed a conflict of interest waiver agreeing to hire Dan Rashbaum in spite of such potential conflicts. Three, if there was a written waiver of conflict of interest signed by Charles Adelson when he hired Dan Rashbaum, they are silent regarding the language and validity of that waiver or about any defect on that waiver. For example, they do not allege that such a waiver existed, but that it fell below the required standards or that it did not contain the type of information that a court would share with the defendant considering such a waiver of conflict of interest. Four, they are silent as to whether either party let the trial court know about the potential conflict due to Dan Rashbaum's prior representation of Donna Adelson or about any facts that establish that the trial court should have known of such prior representation of Donna Adelson by Dan Rashbaum. Five, they are silent as to whether Donna Adelson's testimony would in fact corroborate Charles Adelson's testimony. They only write that her testimony could have corroborated his testimony, not that it would have corroborated it. Six, they are silent as to whether Donna Adelson did or did not want to be interviewed by prosecutors for her own reasons, or whether she did so to protect Charles Adelson's and Dan Rashbaum's trial strategy of keeping the alleged extortion defense secret until the trial started, considering that going forward with the interview would have benefited Donna by making subsequent prosecutions against her more difficult due to Castigar i.e. Donna would have as a defense, if later charged, as she was, an argument that the state could not use any evidence against her that was derived from her statements during such interview. Indeed, they are silent as to why Donna would benefit by not giving an interview to prosecutors, particularly if her truthful testimony would have been the same she would willingly give at trial, considering that she was apparently willing to testify at trial without pleading the fifth, as Prosecutor Georgia Kappelman indicated to the trial court during the hearing on her motion to compel, something that Ms. Descalzo did not deny. Seven, they are silent about why Charles Adelson signed a waiver of all constitutional regard rights regarding his agreement to the decision not to call his parents as witnesses, or even if this was Charles Adelson's idea or Dan Rashbaum's idea. Eight, they are silent about Dan Rashbaum's statement that the defense did not intend to call Harvey and Donna as witnesses and only put them on the witness list as a precaution after the state set them up for interviews. Nine, they are silent as to whether Charles Adelson and wanted Donna to testify or whether he wanted to keep the extortion defense secret and failed to allege that he would have made a different decision had he received legal advice from conflict-free counsel, and why? 10. They are silent about how not calling Donna Adelson as a witness was adverse to the defense, given the lack of knowledge or proof about what Donna would say, she's never testified to date, and given the significant risks involved in calling Donna as a witness at Charles's trial, including the possibility of inconsistencies in the testimony between Charles and Donna about the supposed extortion defense and about their communications after the FBI's bump operation. 11. They are silent about whether Donna and Charles had or did not have a joint defense agreement and whether or not Charles allowed Donna to help with his defense allowed Rashbaum to meet with Donna to discuss strategy for Charles's case, etc. 12. They are silent about whether Donna ever agreed to be a state witness and agreed to testify against Charles Adelson, and of course, we all know that Donna never made such an agreement with the state. Because of Charles Adelson's appellate lawyer's failure to address so many material facts, the motion to relinquish jurisdiction should be denied, if not as frivolous as facially insufficient and premature. We simply do not see how, for example, Charles Adelson's lawyers plan to prove that calling Donna Adelson as a witness would have been beneficial to Charles without forcing her to testify even before her own trial. Regardless of whether the motion is decided now or in a few years, the motion is likely to fail if Dan Rashbaum and or independent counsel gave proper warnings about the potential conflicts of interest to Charles Adelson 
and he, in spite of those warnings, decided to hire Dan Rashbaum. It would be a rare case, one perhaps with obvious proof that the conflicted attorney deceived his defendant client and clearly acted for the benefit of his other client and against the defendant client without the knowledge or understanding and consent of the defendant client before a situation like this could result in a new trial. There would not be any actual conflict of interest if Charles and Donna were aligned in their joint defense at the times in question as much of the evidence gathered after Donna's arrest suggests, see Donna's 2023 planner. There would be no actual conflict of interest if Charles and Donna were aligned in their strategy to keep the extortion defense secret until the trial started. If Dan Rashbaum was advising Donna not to do the state's interview, one has to consider that Donna had independent counsel, and that the suggestion was likely being made to protect the secrecy of the extortion defense, to protect the element of surprise strategy. Donna Adelson was likely asked to sacrifice a benefit to her, being interviewed under subpoena, thus creating a potential Castigar defense to further prosecution, in order to benefit Charles Adelson, i.e. by preserving the defense element of surprise strategy intact. Likewise, there would not have been an adverse impact on the defense if Donna's testimony would have barely helped the defense, given that all of her testimony would have been seen as biased and self-interested at the expense of the huge risk that would come with exposing Donna to cross-examination by Sarah Dugan and or Georgia Kappelman. Indeed, had Donna testified, those post-verdict jail calls we've all heard would likely include conversation with Charles Adelson wondering why the heck he allowed Donna to take the witness stand. Wasn't the blow of having Wendy on the stand enough? We cannot provide you a full evaluation of Charles Adelson's chances of winning the right to a new trial on the basis of conflict arguments because we do not know all the facts. However, we think it is fair to assume that most of the material factual issues above will ultimately reveal themselves as bad facts from Charles Adelson's perspective. The facts are likely to demolish his chances of getting a new trial. Otherwise, he would be mentioning those facts in his motion to relinquish. It seems safe to assume that the motion is so weak and so incomplete because many of the facts not addressed would in fact show that the motion is frivolous. Yet again, we can't give you a final analysis without having all of the actual facts. All we can tell is that, based on what was filed and reasonable inferences from what is stated in the motion and what is missing in the motion, it appears that any future motion by Charles Adelson seeking a new trial due to conflict of interest issues, whenever it is filed, is likely to be a very weak motion. And even then, in the unlikely event that he gets a new trial, it is unlikely that the result will be any different. The evidence against Charles is quite significant, and his extortion defense sounded very pathetic. Of course, there's no guarantee of a conviction if there is a new trial, but we think that the odds of a conviction on retrial are quite high. Conclusion. Generally speaking, the Donna Adelson trial fiasco did leave a bad taste in all of our mouths. That is because what happened simply did not make sense. There is no doubt that Charles Adelson threw a grenade toward Donna's trial in an apparent effort, which succeeded, to bolster his to-be-filed motion to relinquish jurisdiction and to obtain a new trial due to ineffective assistance by conflicted counsel. Indeed, things could not have gone better for Charles Adelson. The fact that the state surprisingly insisted on reserving the right to call him as a rebuttal witness, in spite of the fact that they have no way of forcing him to say anything at trial because he's already in prison, empowered Charles Adelson to throw that grenade. The state insistence that it might call Charles as its own witness, coupled with Charles Adelson's denial that he ever validly consented to a rash bomb representing Donna, or his decision to withdraw his previously given oral consent forced Dan Rashbaum to ask the trial court to allow him to withdraw as Donna's counsel. Donna was willing to waive any and all rights to go forward with the trial, even if it meant a new attorney with virtually no knowledge about the case doing the cross-examination of Charles if the state did call him as a rebuttal witness. 
When Dan Rashbaum moved to withdraw, Donna did not object through her other lawyers. Therefore, I don't see her having a Sixth Amendment argument with respect to the withdrawal of Dan Rashbaum as her lawyer. However, Judge Everett entered a sua sponte order a few days later, removing Alex Morris, who was Dan Rashbaum's co-counsel throughout, and Adam Commissar, the lawyer she had just hired to work with Alex Morris from the case. Although Judge Everett may have been justified in avoiding the issue coming up again at trial, given the fact that he expected Charles Adelson to raise the same objections he did before, which included objecting to anyone on Dan Rashbaum's team cross-examining him. This was done without any notice, an opportunity to be heard by either Donna or the state. There was no evidentiary hearing, including Charles Adelson's testimony, about whether or not he had indeed waived the conflict of interest when Donna wanted to hire Dan Rashbaum. The state did not have an opportunity to withdraw Charles Adelson as a witness. Donna did not have an opportunity to present counter-argument to the court's decision. Judge Everett's order was another big win for Charles Adelson. His plan seemed to be working to perfection. Thus, just a few days later, Charles Adelson filed a motion to relinquish in the appellate court, quoting Judge Everett's order and attempting to get the issue quickly before Judge Everett in the apparent hope of a quick, favorable ruling in Charles Adelson's favor. To those looking from the outside, none of this makes sense. It all looks like gamesmanship. Why would Charles Adelson be allowed to first consent to his mom's being represented by Dan Rashbaum, but then be allowed to withdraw his consent, even though Charles and Donna's interests remain aligned? To a fair observer, he shouldn't be allowed to do this. The answer seems obvious. It seems to us that something like this could only be allowed to happen in situations where the consent was obtained invalidly. If Charles had been deceived by Dan Rashbaum, or it was obtained under duress, or maybe if there was such a change of circumstances that now there was an actual conflict of interest, so that withdrawal of that consent would be reasonable, such as in a situation where Charles turned state witness. We, the outside observers, simply do not see why such a withdrawal of consent should even be allowed without reason or consequence. Otherwise, pure gamesmanship would be rewarded, and here it seems that gamesmanship was rewarded. Why would Charles Adelson first be allowed to waive all conflicts of interests, assuming he did, when hiring Dan Rashbaum after Rashbaum had represented his parents, but then be given a new trial based on what that supposed conflict of interest? Well, he shouldn't, unless in rare circumstances that we do not think will be shown in this case. We believe that a strong factor in any analysis on these conflict issues should be the fact that Dan Rashbaum was a private attorney, not a court-appointed attorney, inflicted with conflict of interest and forced upon a defendant, and that the Adelsons are sophisticated clients with vast experience in the law and the legal system. Here, Charles Adelson hired Dan Rashbaum knowing full well that he had represented his parents about the same case. Donna did the same after Charles was convicted, and she was charged. Both are sophisticated people with a lot of litigation experience. Both are friends with multiple powerful lawyers. Both have had multiple lawyers represent them in various matters. Both have Wendy Adelson in their lives, a daughter-sister who is an experienced lawyer who served as a law professor and is a prestigious law clerk to a federal appellate judge, and who is also represented by one of the best criminal defense lawyers in the country, John Laro. Charles Adelson even allowed prior top-rated attorneys to be substituted by Dan Rashbaum, and none of those attorneys objected or advised the trial court of any potential conflict. While we, the objective observers, do not have a crystal ball, this is what we think the evidence will ultimately show on these issues. Charles Adelson, when he was charged with the murder of Dan Markell, was fully aware that Dan Rashbaum had been representing his mother. However, Dan Rashbaum, of all the lawyers that had been representing the family, had seemed to be the most interested and dedicated one to defend the Adelsons. He had established a good rapport with Charles' mom, Donna, and Donna likely suggested to Charles that he hire Dan Rashbaum to defend him. Charles agreed. 
Throughout the representation of Charles, Donna was heavily involved in helping develop her son's defense, as she had always been. It is likely that a joint defense agreement was signed in an effort to protect the privacy of the communications between Dan Rashbaum and other Adelsons, who themselves were now represented by other lawyers. It is virtually certain that Dan Rashbaum had Charles Adelson, Donna Adelson, and Harvey Adelson sign waivers of conflict of interest, given that he was switching representation from one alleged co-conspirator to another. It is also virtually certain that none of the Adelsons ever expected that a conflict of interest would ever arise, that they all knew in their hearts that none of them would make deals with the state to cooperate against each other. The Adelsons were and continue to be a strongly united family, a united front fighting the government and the charges against them. Dan Rashbaum, Charles and Donna were in unison on the extortion defense and were in agreement that the best course of action was to keep it secret until the start of the trial, limiting the time for prosecutors to react to it and come up with evidence and arguments to ridicule or disprove the defense. Dan Rashbaum's defense strategy seemed strange to the state of Florida. He kept coming up to Tallahassee. He demanded access to all evidence, but he was not talking depositions. He was not doing the usual things defense lawyers would do in this type of case. So prosecutors suspected that Dan Rashbaum, a known poker player, had something up his sleeve. In the process of figuring out what that was, they contacted Harvey and Donna's lawyers to find out if they planned to testify at Charles' trial. Their attorney, Maricel Descalzo, indicated that they would plead the Fifth Amendment right against self-incrimination and refuse to answer questions. But if the state were to subpoena them to testify at trial, they would not plead the Fifth and they would tell the truth. This made prosecutors even more suspicious, so they subpoenaed Donna and Harvey to appear for compelled interviews, interviews for which they would receive limited immunity, whatever they said could not be used against them except on a charge of perjury if they knowingly lied during the interview. Donna and Harvey then objected, not because they did not want to be interviewed, since going through such an interview makes it a little harder for prosecutors to later charge them, as they would have a defense that all or some of the evidence used to charge them later, if they were later charged, was derived from their statements at their interviews, and therefore could not be used against them. Dan Rashbaum also objected vociferously, not because he wanted to protect his former clients, but because he wanted to protect the secrecy of the extortion defense. Charles and Donna were all in on this too. They also wanted to protect the secrecy of the extortion defense. Indeed, there were never any plans to call Donna or Harvey as witnesses. The plan all along was for only Charles to testify about the extortion, that the murder was done by the killers who were convinced and convicted on their own, not on orders of the Adelsons, and that they then extorted Charles Adelson for payment for the murder. They would not take the risk of subjecting Donna and Harvey to cross-examination by astute prosecutors Georgia Kappelman or Sarah Dugan, potentially exposing inconsistencies in the complex story told by Charles Adelson. So, bottom line, the evidence is likely to show that Charles willingly, knowingly, and voluntarily understood all conflict issues and waived them, that Dan Rashbaum worked hard and focused on the single goal of getting an acquittal for Charlie, that Donna worked with Charles and Dan Rashbaum to help prepare the defense, and that all were in agreement about keeping the element of surprise. They all were united in the decision to stop the prosecutors from learning ahead of trial details about the planned defense. The stipulation signed by Charles Adelson to waive all of his con constitutional rights, to call his parents as witnesses, and in exchange to the agreement by the state to no longer take the compelled interviews of Harvey and Donna was made for the benefit of Charles Adelson and at the expense of Donna, who willingly gave away the protections that would have come with going through the interview, including making it harder for the state to charge her down the line. In other words, there was neither an actual conflict of interest nor an adverse impact to the defense when the issue of stopping prosecutors from interviewing Donna came up or in how it was dealt with by Dan Rashbaum and Charles Adelson. Therefore, the motion will likely be denied as frivolous. 
All of this has a very strong smell of gamesmanship by Charles Adelson. Our system of justice cannot be so easily manipulated by rich and sophisticated defendants, or can it? <laughs> the bottom line is that they all wanted to win, and they were making decisions with that singular goal in mind. A win by Charlie was the best protection for Donna. They all wanted Charles Adelson to be acquitted. Dan Rashbaum wanted a career-defining win on national TV. Charles Adelson wanted his freedom back and the ability to go to Asia and enjoy the rest of his life surrounded by beautiful Asian women. Donna wanted the win so badly, too. She wanted revenge. She was so optimistic about her son's chances at trial that she created a list on her planner of all the people and entities that the Adelsons should sue after Charles was acquitted. There can be no doubt that winning was the driving force behind their actions. Which judge in his or her right mind would ever believe that these three people decided not to call Donna as a witness at Charles' trial to protect Donna? They were all united in one goal. They all wanted to win and for the win to protect all of them. If Charles wanted his mom to testify, he would not have waved away the right to call her. There was no conflict. Of course, if the ultimate facts are different, then the analysis will be different. Time will tell, we shall see. If the motion to relinquish jurisdiction is granted, this will all be revealed sooner. Otherwise, Charles Adelson can still raise those arguments later in a motion for post-conviction relief if the appellate court affirms his conviction. As of today, October 31st at noon, 2024, the First District Court of Appeal has not yet ruled on the motion to relinquish we will keep you updated. From a technical point of view, it is bizarre that Charles Adelson is asking for this type of issue to be addressed in the trial court even before his appeal is considered. An evidentiary hearing on Charles Adelson's claim of ineffective assistance of counsel by Dan Rashbaum would entail testimony from Charles Adelson, from Dan Rashbaum, from Donna Adelson, and probably from Maricel Descalzo. Secrets about trial preparation would have to be revealed. Dan Rashbaum would testify in his own defense, since the motion would allege improper conduct by him, and he would be entitled to disclose details, including attorney-client communications. The state would be the one asking the important questions to Dan Rashbaum about trial strategy and decision-making, and about Charles Adelson's role in making decisions in the defense of the case. Charles Adelson could not object on the basis of attorney-client privilege. So, let's say that Charles is allowed to go back to the trial court now and file his motion, and then there is such an evidentiary hearing. All of these details would be revealed. Let's say that the trial court denies the motion. Let's say that the appellate court affirms the denial of the motion, but reverses on another issue raised in the direct appeal, not in the motion for post-conviction relief. So Charles would get a new trial, but now the state would have all this new information to work with that it would not have had if Charles Adelson went through the normal process, allowed his direct appeal to be handled first, and then, only if he lost the appeal, he filed a motion for post-conviction relief. In essence, doesn't this move also suggest, therefore, that Charles' appellate lawyer thinks that there aren't any good appellate issues to raise? Must be because otherwise it makes no sense to ask for the conflict issue to be addressed first. Thanks for watching, Mentor Lawyer, Ladybug, and Ed. Well, I think Ed did a sensational job, and if you agree, Make sure you let him know in the comments. I really appreciate it. Ed, you did an amazing job. Thank you so much. A deep dive into the Charles Adelson conflict of interest defense by Mentor Lawyer. Charles Adelson, the South Florida dentist convicted in the murder for hire plot that culminated in the murder of his former brother in law, FSU law professor Dan Markell.